I feel very honored and blessed to be here with you. We come together as people of faith, people of conscience, in a world that's in such a need for peace and justice. Uh, my own roots are in Louisiana. Working class family from the Catholic tradition. But when we gathered into our little church each Sunday, we didn't talk about peace and justice. It was not an integral part of our faith that I've come to realize that must be the essence of our faith, no matter what faith tradition we might be coming from. I entered the military after college during the Vietnam days. Prophet Isaiah, I think, said it very well. They will take evil and call it good. They will take the lie and give it to you as a truth. And our leaders in our country and other leaders are very skilled at doing this. And I bought into that evil and into the lie given to us as through during the days of Vietnam and went off to the military for four years, thought of making it a career. But Vietnam was that turning point in my life. I, I think each of us can go back on our own journey, which continues. This is just a moment on the journey today. But there are those experiences and individuals who touch our lives in rather unique <coughs> ways. They awaken something in us. They help us to somehow go into the arms of God. And that's what happened to me in Vietnam. It was the beginning of an awakening, a raising of consciousness. And it was brought about because of the war the death, the destruction there. Death was very close, and I must say, uh, my thoughts turned to God. I felt grateful when I came home. And when I came home, I began to realize that more today than ever before, there are some basics that I've come to because of, the, of Vietnam and because of Iraq and all wars. Our God does not bless war. Our Creator does not bless killing. The Holy One does not bless hardship or violence and, it's, and discrimination in its many forms. No. <coughs> It took me some years, but after Vietnam, I returned. I felt a need to apologize for what we had done to our country. <coughs> Over two million killed, so much death and destruction. I went back alone. I should have gone back with Vietnam brothers, but I went alone. Spent a month traveling through the country. And I had with me a letter of apology, apologizing for what we, our country, <coughs> the people of Vietnam, the untold suffering and death that we caused. I was quite surprised at the responses. I did not see that anger that I thought I would see. I think it was best captured by a Buddhist monk that I spent time with at this monastery in Vietnam, who said to me, he said, Roy, our greatest enemy in life is ignorance. Ignorance. <coughs> our weapon must be wisdom. Our weapon must be love and nonviolence. I really think about the words of this holy monk often because, especially now, there is so much we don't know about our country's foreign policy. 
about Iraq and so many other countries, with cultures so much older than our own and history is so much older, and religious beliefs so much older than our own. And that ignorance, of course, will get us in big trouble. When I left Vietnam, my hope was in shambles. And as we know, hope is the essence of our faith and joy. And war kills that. When I left Vietnam, I wanted to be a healer, a peacemaker. I entered the marital community, a group working in 25 countries around the world, serving the people. After being ordained a Catholic priest, I was sent to Bolivia to serve the poor where this slum of Barrio on the outskirts of the capital became my home for the next five years. And really it was here that I got educated. Of the poor that I went to serve, they became my teachers. And that's what I've learned, that we have so much to learn. And if we can only put our feet in the cultures, the struggles of others, especially the poor, the oppressed of our world. They will teach us, and we have so much to learn. Bolivia was like most of the developing world, the people struggling for survival, <coughs> living under a very brutal regime, general bonds or a dictator that was supported by my country, which said, what's happening in the developing world wherever there's that poverty and oppression, people will come together and start organizing. They will seek peace. They will seek uh, a living wage for their labor. They will work for school for their children, for a clinic to go to and get those needed medicines when their kids are sick. And really, that's at the very core of, um, I think of, of our faith to be compassionate, to respond to those who are the victims of violence, oppression, militarism. We can only think about the billions of dollars, over 500 billion that we have to date sent to Iraq. I have a rundown put together by some folks, peacemakers in the UP, just equating what Michigan and over $12 billion have come from our taxes here, what that can do in the way of more schools, uh, more people with health care, more teachers. We know that. It is a theft from the poor, from those who struggle for peace, struggle for justice. <clears throat> It was in my fifth year that I was arrested in Bolivia, among the many. The jails were filled. <coughs> Being in Rango, um, I was kicked out of the country for so long. And I came home. It was a very lonely part of the struggle at that time. I didn't know where to plug in, where to go. My life is revolving now, which I found a lot of meaning in, in, in the struggle with the poor of Bolivia. But then I went to El Salvador with friends, a country that was going through some real, real hard times. Worse than the country I came from. Archbishop Oscar Romero gone down at the altar for his defense of the poor. Four church women who went there at the invitation of Bishop Romero, raped and killed because of their faith and love for people. 